All right, we're in Mark chapter 15, and <clears throat> we left off in the story, the text of the crucifixion of Jesus with uh, Christ being crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning, and he was on the cross until noon, and then there was darkness over the face of the earth at the sixth hour, verse 33 says, which is noon, and that would last until the ninth hour, which is about three o'clock in the afternoon, and that, of course, is when Jesus died. We left off, we were talking about that darkness and trying to ask ourselves to imagine if that darkness continued, what if the sun had never shone again, not just physically, but spiritually, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in our sermon this morning. But think about what verse 33 says, when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And so we understand that something unique and special and important is happening here, and God is testifying to that through this uh, miraculous display seen uh, in the land with uh, the sun being darkened. And again, it's hard to imagine that kind of darkness. It's more than you know, just an eclipse when it gets dark during the middle of the day, but this is like the ten plagues and that darkness that was a plague upon the people of Egypt, um, a darkness that is not natural but supernatural. And it makes you wonder how anyone, after all of these things, could still have doubted that Jesus was the Messiah or doubted the importance of, of his crucifixion, but of course they did. But verse 34 says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And verse 35 says that some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And I want us to think a little bit about this passage and a couple of things. First of all, that um, Jesus cries out this uh, statement which, of course, is a quotation from the Old Testament that we'll look at in just a minute from Psalm 22. But he's speaking in Arabic, the, the normal, common, everyday language of the people of that day. Um, but they didn't quite understand what he said in two senses. One, they didn't understand the reference to the Old Testament scriptures and what Jesus was talking about. But also, they, they didn't quite understand his words. Some thought that he was crying out for Elijah. So the word Eloi is similar in sound to Elias, and so they misunderstood. I think what that needs to show us and remind us of is the intense suffering that Jesus was enduring. Um, the, the agony of the cross you know, is not just the pain in the hands and, and the feet from being crucified, but it's the slow suffocating to death with the body being suspended in the way that it is. Uh, the diaphragm muscle is, is unable to work by itself as it normally does. And so in order to take a breath, you have to pull up with your arms uh, and the arms, you know, are hanging on those nails. And so all of that, the weight of your body is not only suspended on the nails, but now you're having to pull up with your arms just to be able to get a breath. And so when Jesus would say these words from the cross, as time went on, and here we're at nearly the very moment of his death, it, he would become weaker and weaker, and it would be harder for him to get a deep breath to be able to speak loudly. And so they hear the words, but they don't quite understand, at least some of them don't, what Jesus said here. And that indicates to us you know, some of the suffering that he was enduring and how hard it was for him to breathe and to, to speak uh, clearly, obviously. But they misinterpreted also because of the hardness of their hearts. And they, they, for so many things, had not wanted to hear what Jesus was saying. So some assume that he's call, calling for Elijah. Now, when they make that statement, think again, you know, in, in their terms, what their mind is focused on, what they're centered on. Back in verse 30, they had said to Jesus, save thyself, right, and come down from the cross. So as we talked about, their focus was on self, 
they didn't need a savior, they could save themselves, but also that Jesus, if you're like all of us, your most important concern is yourself, and you're suffering terribly, and you claim you don't deserve this, and you say you're the son of God, so if you really are, think about yourself and come down from the cross. So when he cries out, they are expecting him to do something to save himself, because they can't grasp this idea that he, in his innocence and purity and perfection, is enduring all of this for them, that he's not thinking about himself, he's thinking about others. In fact, he was thinking about me, and he was thinking about you. We were on his mind while he was suffering there at Calvary. And so they're focused on self. They expect Jesus to do something selfish. But instead, what he does is to cry out in his agony, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And to do so in such a way that not only demonstrates the worst agony of the cross, which was far worse than the physical, and that was the, the spiritual and the emotional toil that uh, was placed upon Jesus. To do it in such a way that expresses that while at the same time gives hope because he does this by quoting scripture. And so I want us to go back to Psalm 22 and read some of this psalm just to remind us of what is, is being said here and the connection of it to the Old Testament and this prophecy of Jesus, but also to give us a little insight as to the suffering that's taking place here. So the 22nd Psalm begins with those words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we've studied before that the, uh, the 22nd Psalm, of course, talks about the suffering of Jesus. The 23rd Psalm talks about the shepherd, Jesus as the shepherd. And the 24th Psalm talks about his victory and his resurrection and his return to heaven. So those three Psalms, you know, go together to give us a portrait of Jesus in, in prophecy. But the 22nd Psalm starts with those words and when Jesus cries out, he's not just quoting scripture, just for the sake of quoting scripture. Um, he, he's meaning the words that, that he says, but he is also quoting scripture. And sometimes people only want to think of Jesus suffering and not even consider the passage that he's quoting. But we don't do that with any other verse that Jesus quotes. When we are you know, reading his sermons or his teaching and he refers to the Old Testament scriptures, we go back to see what it means there so we can understand how Jesus is applying it in his teaching. And we have to do the same thing here because even though he's crying out in his agony, he is also quoting scripture for a reason and for a purpose. So the psalm says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? We're told that this is a psalm of David, and we uh, think of many times in David's life when he no doubt felt like he was forsaken, or at least it appeared that God had forsaken him. If David, you know, if you're supposed to be the new king of Israel, if God has chosen you and anointed you, then why are you hiding in this cave and King Saul is trying to kill you? If you are the true king of Israel, why is your son Absalom rebelling against you and chasing you out of Jerusalem and trying to kill you? If God is on your side and you are you know, who you claim to be, then why are all these bad things happening? So when you put that in the context of David's life, we understand that he faced situations that looked like God was not on his side or not with him. And so the words cried out here echo that sentiment. But he says in verse 2, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. So he's praying, but it doesn't seem like God is listening. Verse 3, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And so David, in the context of his life again, 
uh, is praying to God, but it doesn't seem like God is listening, but he knows that God is holy, and he knows that God is listening, and God's going to do the right thing. But it didn't appear that way from a human perspective. So he reminds us and reminds God of how he had heard the prayers of their fathers and answered those prayers and delivered them. But then he says, I am a worm. I am more lowly uh, than all of them or brought down lower than all of them. And so everyone was mocking him. He was rejected. He was despised. And, uh, and, and they made fun of him in his suffering. And while we apply that to David, we also see in that very clearly the prophecy of Jesus. Because the very thing that they said to David, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him, is the exact thing that they're saying at the cross about Jesus. He trusted in the Lord to deliver him, let him deliver him, you know, if he truly delights in him. They're saying to Jesus, if you come down from the cross, that will prove that God does love you the way that you say that he does. And so while it has application to David, it's obviously looking forward to the time of Jesus. And so in verse 9 it says, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. And again, while there's application of that to David, that you know God had always been present in his life, it also points us to Christ. The very fact that he was born of a woman was the working of God. His birth was miraculous, a virgin birth, of course, and it was God's miraculous involvement that caused that to happen. And so it was all God's plan and all God's purpose that was being carried out in the birth, in the life, and even in the death of Jesus. Verse 11, he says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And again, you think about Christ, and you think about how surrounded he was by enemies, how all his disciples forsook him and fled, and even, you know, had they stood with him, there was nothing they could do to deliver him from what he was facing and, and what he was enduring. Many bulls, verse 12, have compassed me or surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. And that passage obviously is describing the crucifixion. And so there was no time in David's life where he actually suffered in this way and to this extent, though it may have felt like that to him. Uh, but this is obviously looking directly at the cross. And what's described for us here is just how horrible the crucifixion was. Again, to be surrounded by enemies that are like uh, ravening lions, which means they're lions that haven't eaten in a while and they're, they're hungry, they're starving. And so they're roaring and they're lashing out. Um, thirsty for blood is the idea. Uh, to be poured out like water, of course, is all of his strength is gone upon the cross as he suffers there. Uh, bones being out of joint is not necessarily literal, though it, it could happen literally with the, uh, the way that crucifixion took place, the soul, shoulder sockets coming out of joint very easily. But uh, whether or not that literally happened, uh, the pain was uh, you know, related to that. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. We're told, of course, in John's account of the gospel that when they pierced Jesus' side, that uh, forthwith came there out blood and water. And the blood and water were mixed together. And we're told by uh, medical people that that has to do with the, uh, the sac around your heart being uh, pierced or being ruptured. And that water can then mix in with, uh, with the blood. So some have speculated, they say things like Jesus died of a broken heart, that 
that's ultimately what happened on the cross, that his heart gave out, and that's where the water came from. But it may have been pierced by, by the spear. But anyway, the language here is talking about, again, the stress that would have been upon him uh, physically. He says, again, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. A potsherd is a broken piece of pottery. So you know to make pottery, you take wet clay and you form it in the shape, and then you have to bake all the liquid out of it. And so it becomes dry and it's able to hold water. And then when it gets old and more dry and brittle, it breaks and you have pieces of broken pottery. So all of the strength being drained is what Jesus uh, was going through on the cross. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, uh, again, from extreme thirst and dehydration. The, the tongue often would swell. The mouth would be dry. That Your tongue would just stick inside your mouth. He says, thou hast brought me into the dust of death, which is exactly where he was. Again, surrounded by dogs. He's talking about wicked people there who are acting like wild animals, like dogs. The assembly of the wicked they are. They pierced my hands and feet, which again goes back to the crucifixion. And throughout history, there have been different ideas. You know, it used to be believed that the piercing would take place in the palms. And archaeological discoveries and so forth have shown that it was probably in the wrist where those two bones come together. But either way, the hands were pierced. And then the feet, we often think about the two feet being put together and the nail driven through the top. But again, archaeological discoveries have shown the feet being placed one on either side of the board and the nail driven through. Uh, there's a hollow spot in your foot just in front of the heel that um, will be able to support your weight, but it's very painful um, to do so. But either way, wherever the nails were, his hands and his feet still were uh, pierced, which again is the crucifixion. I may tell all my bones, of course, the body being stretched out. You could see uh, the uh, bone structure under the skin. They look and stare upon me. And of course, the parting of his garments and casting lots happened literally at, uh, at the crucifixion. Now, all of that describes the agony that our Lord was suffering and enduring. And in the midst of that, we can understand why he would call out to God and even why he would say something like, why hast thou forsaken me? Because to look at someone in that condition, enduring all of that, your first thought wouldn't be that God was with that person. It looks like God has abandoned him. And so David felt that way. Men throughout all ages have felt that way. You and I have probably felt that way, that God has forsaken us on occasion. But Jesus, of course, epitomizes it through the intense suffering that he was enduring and enduring in complete innocence. That when you and I suffer, sometimes we know deep within us we, we deserve it because of our sins. But Jesus never sinned. He never did anything wrong. And so his crying out echoes that agony of, of separation. So verse 19 of this psalm, he says, But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. And then verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And that's another verse that's quoted in the New Testament over in the book of Hebrews. And it's about Jesus. That, of course, he would declare God's name. And it has to do in the context of Hebrews about the church. That praising God takes place within the church that was purchased with the blood of Jesus. So we're still looking at Christ and the crucifixion and seeing a, a glimpse of the end result of it. So if you put it in the context of David, David is asking God to deliver him, and if God delivers him, then he would use the opportunities that he had in the congregation of Israel when they assembled to worship. He would tell the people about God, sing his praise, and talk about what God had done. And that same thing happens in the church about what God did for Jesus. Uh, the difference is, of course, that God didn't deliver Jesus from the death that he was suffering. 
Even though he cried out, God allowed him to endure it. And even though he could have prayed and called the angels to deliver him, he was submissive to God's will. And when he says, why hast thou forsaken me? He's not asking God to remove the burden of the crucifixion from him. He's, I believe, showing the difference between David and himself. That David, in his weakness, cried out for deliverance. And, of course, God heard and delivered him. Jesus is crying out as well. He's in a situation far worse than anything David ever experienced. And he's also crying out to God with the words of David. But he's not asking God to deliver him. He had prayed, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And God's will was for him to endure all of the cross, including death. And Jesus is still submissive to that. But he's calling out in the words of David to show, number one, the terribleness of his suffering, to point people to this psalm so they'll understand that he's the fulfillment of it, and number three, to emphasize the separation that's, that's taking place here. So David, um, even though he was suffering, uh, he, was, he wasn't ultimately separated from God because he could still call out to him and God would hear his prayer and deliver him. And ultimately, Jesus is not separated from God because the last thing that he says on the cross is, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And, of course, he's raised from the grave. But somehow in there, and, and I don't know how to explain it, and I think I even said last week that I believe this is the most difficult verse in all the Bible, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't know how to understand how Jesus was forsaken, in what sense or to what extent that being forsaken um, manifested itself. I know that 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus was made to be sin for us in the sense that he was bearing our sins on the cross. I know that Isaiah 52 tells us that sin and iniquity separates man from God. But I also know that Jesus didn't actually commit those sins and so he was paying the price for our sins without himself actually being guilty of those sins, but he became the sacrifice. And through the shedding of his blood, all of those sins were forgiven. So if there was a separation, if there were a separation between Jesus and God because of his bearing our sins, it was only temporary because the shedding of his blood took away those sins and obviously fellowship was restored. Jesus told the thief, today shalt thou be with me in paradise, not in torment. Jesus didn't die a sinner and have to go into torment and suffer you know, the, the fires and the agonies of torment for our sins. He paid the price on the cross and he went into paradise just as the thief who was forgiven on the cross went into paradise. And so that separation didn't last into the grave. So again, exactly what it was and how it manifested and what the extent of the separation was, I don't know. But what I do know from the psalm is that even though it looked for, for all intents and purposes from a human perspective like God had completely abandoned him, Jesus knew that his father was always with him and would be with him again, even if there was a temporary separation because of sin, he could trust the Father and commit his spirit, his eternal soul, to his Father's trust, and everything would be okay because he was doing the Father's will. And that's what the end of this psalm is about. So if you notice in verse 23, he says, Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel." For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. And I hear so many times people read from the gospel accounts and they say, 
you know, the sun became dark and there was darkness over the land because God turned his face from Jesus. Yet the very psalm that Jesus quotes from the cross says that he did not hide his face from him, that he did hear his prayer. And again, I don't mean that there wasn't any separation. It seems like there was. I, just, I don't understand exactly what it was. And even if God's head were turned from him for a moment, he turned it back because Jesus, again, trusted in the Father. He didn't go into torment and all of those other things. But I think it's just important to understand what this psalm was pointing to ultimately, that as dark as it was and as bad as it looked, God was faithful and he didn't abandon his son. So it says again that uh, he didn't hide his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. That didn't mean that he delivered him from the cross, but it means that he heard his prayer. And of course, he's going to uh, protect him in eternity and bring him back from the grave and all of those things. So verse 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he is the governor among the nations. All they that uh, be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. And none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. And while you can make application to David, it's also looking to Christ and what's going to happen after the crucifixion. There's a kingdom that's going to come into an existence, and that kingdom is going to be reigned over by Christ, and it's going to go into all nations, and there will be a seed that will serve him. That's the faithful remnant, the seed line from, from all nations and for a generation, and they're going to declare his righteousness that God did all of this and made salvation available. And all of that comes through the preaching of the gospel because of the crucifixion of uh, Jesus. And so again, it's a psalm that's about suffering and uh, about you know, the agony of the cross and the separation and the seeming separation that takes place. But ultimately, it's a psalm of hope that as dark as it looks at Calvary, the sun is going to shine again. And, of course, that's the resurrection on the first day of the week. So when Jesus quotes these words, he's not just quoting Scripture, you know, arbitrarily. Uh, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't mean that there was a sense in which God forsook him. That very well could be. But, again, exactly, you know, what, what that is, I, I can't fully understand it or grasp it. So when Jesus quotes these words, instead of, knowing that he's quoting from the Psalms and saying, well, let's go read the Psalm and see what Jesus is talking about. They said he's calling for Elijah. So either they didn't hear him clearly or they didn't want to hear him clearly. And again, they are not applying his words correctly as they've done with so many of the things that, that Jesus taught. So let's go back to Mark now and notice the, uh, the aftermath of this. So they ran and took a sponge full of vinegar and uh, this one wasn't mixed with myrrh like the other was. They put it on the reed and gave him to drink, and then they said, you know, let's sit back and wait and see if Elijah comes. And then verse 37, Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And so his spirit left his body. Jesus died. And Mark says the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And so, again, we have another sign from God that this is no ordinary death, but this is of tremendous importance. When we think about the Old Testament system and the tabernacle and later the temple, we know that there was the holy place and then there was the most holy place. And those two were separated by a veil. In the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant on which was the mercy seat where God's presence would appear, his glory would appear. 
and uh, before which the high priest could go alone. He's the only one who could go in that room, and he could only go on one day a year, the Day of Atonement, and not without blood. He had to bring a blood sacrifice on that day. And so God's presence was separated from his people. He was there, but he was in the most holy place that they couldn't go into. So there was fellowship with God, but it was at a distance. When Jesus died, that veil was torn in two, and not from bottom to top, as though someone you know, came in and cut it and, and tore it, but from top to bottom, showing that this was God's doing from heaven to earth. But that veil being torn in two symbolized the fact that access to the most holy place was granted, and not literally to go into the temple to the most holy place, because we're not going to need that temple anymore. Worship is not going to take place there or in any one particular location, but over all the earth, true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4. And so that symbolized the fact that the way to God the Father was now open. That's through the blood of Jesus. So when we're cleansed by his blood, we have immediate fellowship with our Father in heaven, not at a distance, but directly he dwells in us and we dwell in him we don't have to go visit a priest or a high priest and tell them to go to communicate to God for us we have direct access because we are priests and Jesus is our high priest the only one that we need we don't have to pray through saints or through angels or through Mary to get to the father we can talk directly to the father because of what Jesus did and the power of his blood. And that's what this veil tearing in two symbolizes and and represents. Verse 39 says, When the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on afar off, many whom uh, among whom rather was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the less and of Joseph and Salome, who also... When he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. And I want us to to end with uh, this thought today that the veil being rent, of course, and and the power of that, the centurion who has seen and heard all that's happened recognizes, again, there's something unique about this death and something special about Jesus. Truly, he was the son of God. And then you have all of these women who were present at the cross. And I think it's worth stopping and asking ourselves, you know, first of all, where were the men? They all forsook him and fled. So frightened were they that Mark told us about himself, apparently, that they grabbed his coat and he left it behind him and ran away. Peter followed, but he followed afar off, and he denied the Lord. Those brave men who were going to fight to the death for Jesus are nowhere to be seen except for John. He was there. But these women are there. And where would the church be without faithful Christian women? Right? We get caught up sometimes in the roles of men and women, and men have leadership roles and those things, and we forget that the real grounding of the church is the women. So many congregations, if you count men who are present versus women, it's not even close, right? It's, it's faithful women who always have been the backbone of God's people. And it shows us here in this situation, in this scenario, when so many who had said so many bold things became afraid for their lives, these women didn't care. They only cared about being where Jesus was and faithfully serving him to the end. They were supporting Mary. They were supporting one another. They were witnessing what happened to him. And, and what a great source of strength and a great show of strength we find from, uh, from these women here. And so we need to remember that, the importance of all of us in the service of, of our Lord, that we may not have the same roles and some may not be as public as others, but faithfulness is what matters. And the Lord, no doubt, was pleased to be able to look down and to see those who truly remained faithful to him right there by his side all the way to his death. And that was, for the most part, women, with just a couple of of exceptions. 
So we need to keep that in mind also. Lord willing, next time we'll pick up there at verse 42 and talk about Jesus' burial and then, of course, the resurrection. And that brings us into the last chapter of Mark. So we're coming to the end here. And uh, we'll spend a little time, of course, in chapter 16. But uh, we're coming to the end of the book. And hopefully we'll be there before too long. But anyway, we'll stop here. And we'll pick up there with our next lesson.